Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. JBS Foods is a $30 billion meat processor that most people didn't even know about until they paid ransomware attackers reveal $11 million last June in order to get plants in the U.S. and Brazil up and running and prevent what is believed to be up to 5 terabytes of data from being leaked. According to securityscorecard.com, the hackers obtained leaked credentials from employees in Australia and began probing the company's network and extracting data three months prior to issuing their demands. Security Scorecard estimates that over 20% of food companies have a known vulnerability and nearly 400 have suffered a breach and or attack. To help shed some light on these vulnerabilities and how to prevent or respond to them, we're excited to welcome Matt Parsons, Director of Network and Security Product Management at SunGuard Availability Services, to the program. SunGuard is a leading provider of network and cloud computing security services. So Matt, thanks again for joining us today. And jumping right into it, it's been about a year since the big JBS ransomware attack. What are some of the things that we've been able to learn from or, or take away from that, uh, that situation? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think the biggest eye opener is that uh, just how reliant we are upon critical infrastructure um, and really what type of impact an outage can have. Uh, for example, the JBS meat industry, they serviced uh, almost a quarter of all of America's beef. Uh, the Colonial Pipeline uh, was almost half of all of the East Coast fuel. Um, so when you see the reach of what these infrastructure services provide and we look at other, cr other critical infrastructure services, such as power, uh, we know with the uh, Texas cold winter snap and the power outages there, even though it wasn't a ransomware attack, you can imagine a situation where there was a, a coordinated effort where we lost fuel, food, and power infrastructure. It, it would be chaos. Um, so I, I think one of the biggest things we learned was that there is very much a, a widespread potential impact to not only the economy, uh, but the health and safety as well. I think the other lesson we learned is that there needs to be regulation. Uh, there is often very little uh, regulation in these industries. A lot of applications and servers are on very old, outdated legacy systems. Uh, and certain things can be prevented, which is very basic security controls that uh, you would think are common in this space, but uh, are actually not widely implemented. So uh, one of the examples of that is the Strength Strengthening American Cybersecurity Act, which was passed in 2022. Again, one of those things to help promote uh, proactive threat defense, um, bug hunting, things to uh, prevent future impact on critical infrastructure. So I think, yeah, those, those are the biggest things we learned was that uh, just the, the amount of impact it could cause, um, the fragility and dependency we have upon technology when it comes to our infrastructure and the need for regulations around it. You know, in looking at some of these groups, as you mentioned, um, we're learning more about them as they become more notorious, if you will. Are you seeing any of their tactics sort of trending towards a particular avenue of approach or or way that they're going after some of these companies? Yeah, I think largely the, the main attack vectors remain the same. Um, lack of uh, misconfiguration uh, by a human, uh, human error, just clicking on bad links in an email. There's always going to be your your passwords that are misplaced and, and um, leveraged by bad actors. I think the biggest thing we've seen recently trend wise is that once they get that initial foothold in, they've got that initial system compromise, they can very, very quickly uh, spread out horizontally and laterally throughout the company. Um, we're seeing a lot more advanced tactics with scripting and tools to where once they're in, they're automatically scanning and spreading to the tune of minutes um, where they could have domain control over the entire network. Um, I think we're seeing a lot more trends towards patience and sophistication. Uh, once they're into these companies, they, they are actually um, absolutely doing their uh, research into the company. What do they do? What kind of business they're in? Uh, when would be the most impactful time to have a ransomware event? Is it around a billing cycle? Is it around, you know, if they're manufacturing a project or delivery they've got coming up, um, they're gonna look at revenue. They're gonna look at docs to see if they have cybersecurity insurance, uh, what their payouts are. And they're going to very uh, data-based, uh, in a data-based format, come up with a number for ransomware that's, that's based upon how much, the, the most that they can get out of the company. Um, 
And I think there is also a level of sophistication and patience in terms of once they're in leveraging that company for other attack avenues. So who are they peered with from a site to site uh, perspective or in the case of a solar winds, you know, can we distribute malware as a Trojan horse through one of their legitimate patches? So there's uh, definitely a lot more we're seeing on that side of the house. What's your take? Do you end up paying the ransomware or as a general premise? Do you try to stay away from that? Yeah, ideally no, because um, it's just a big chunk of money usually that they're asking for and it, it reinforces their behavior. It, it pays out for them and it just gives them more resources and willpower to do it again in the future. Um, but it depends, right? It, it depends on what kind of incident response plan you have, what type of incident response team there is. Um, do you have offsite air gapped backups that are safe. Um, if you can confidently say you've got a plan in place, you've got the offsite backups and the ability to restore those into a isolated, clean white room to then do all of your forensics, analyzing, scrubbing, you know, diffuse that time bomb and then bring it up into production, I think I'd be less inclined to pay. Um, if I know for a fact I didn't have backups or my backups were corrupted or encrypted as a part of the attack and I've got um, you know, intellectual property that is the lifeline of my business or my data is my business to where if you don't pay, you're, you're, you're going out of business anyways. I think in those cases, you almost have to pay. Um, but we would still recommend not paying upfront. It definitely leverage agencies and firms that specialize in ransomware attacks um, because they can a lot of times really assist in that. So they'll look at signatures and things you know oh, we're seeing it phone home to this ip uh, based on the signatures and where it's phoning home to these all kind of coincide with a, a dark side group and you know based on other companies we've worked with with where we see that they pay 95 95 percent of the time if you pay the ransomware they'll restore your data so they are a quote unquote an ethical uh ransomware company but they'll be able to do that in certain things like um certain ransomware variants they'll have even decryption keys for. So you could get uh, the FBI or other agencies involved and they may even have uh, a decryption key to get you out of it without having to pay. So there are options I would say paying is, is definitely last resort in my book. No, it makes sense. And we've heard that from others as well. And I think that's the, the general thought initially. It just can be obviously difficult presented with those circumstances at times. Um, one of the things you mentioned as well was response plans and having things in place to be ready. Not if, but it seems more like when these attacks take place. In your experience in working with the industrial sector, what are some of the things that may be missing from those response plans that are absolutely crucial in getting back on your feet? Yeah, it, it, it's sad, but it, it almost seems like the instant response plan itself is what's missing, <laughs> you know, not just a component of it. Um, I think just having a, a response plan is is one thing. It, you've got to have that as a step one, which surprisingly, a lot of companies don't even have that. Um, within an instant response plan, I think two, two big areas I, I think we see a lot of gaps in are the communication side of it. So um, just basic triage, how do you get that war room together? Um, you know, and we'll work through, uh, we've got services around this where we'll work through with companies on a kind of a tabletop exercise. So let's say you come in, your ransomware out, you can't get anything. You know, this is one of the execs. What do you do? Who do you call? Well, I'll call Bob over in security. Okay. How do you call Bob? Well, I've got him on teams. He's always responsive. We'll get him on teams. He's always there. Okay. Well, your teams is on the infrastructure that's locked out. How do you get a hold of him? Okay, well, uh, I'll get his phone number. Okay, what's his phone number? Oh, I'll look it up in the company directory on our community <laughs> site. Yeah. Okay, well, that's down too. That, that's a part of your infrastructure was locked out. Uh, how, how do you get a hold of it? Uh, geez, I don't know. So things like that, um, you know, even having manually printed physical you know, copies of who you need to contact or, you know, what conferencing system you might use. Again, you have to assume your internal communications, all of your contacts, uh, emails, everything is down. So having that plan to at least, you know, get everybody together to consolidate and coordinate and then plan that response, I think is a, a big key element. And then second part to that is, is once you're there, having the ability to recover, because like you said, it's not a matter of if, but when. Um, there, there are always going to be zero days and, 
you know, Bob's that click those links in the emails. Uh, you just can't, you can't stop everything. So having the ability to restore data that is air gapped, that's immutable backups, you know, is going to be safe and not uh, be able to be corrupted or tampered with uh, if a hacker gets control of your production environment, they're absolutely critical for these situations. No, it makes a lot of sense. Learn a lot, learn a lot about the industry or heard you talk a lot about the industry. Let's talk a little bit about SunGuard and some of the things that you guys do and, and the folks that you work with. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, so SunGuard has been around for over 40 years. Uh, we are a managed service provider that uh, specializes in private and public cloud solutions, network and security solutions, as well as uh, disaster recovery solutions. Excellent. So kind of wrapping things up here a little bit, Matt, if we can have you put your prognosticator hat on a little bit and look down the road, maybe 12 to 18 months, what are some of the different the trends that you see emerging and from a cybersecurity perspective and what can the industrial sector do to really prepare and respond to them? Yeah, I, I see a trend toward a lot more sophisticated attacks where we're seeing ransomware embedded within other legitimate type applications and controls. So your solar winds type attacks, the log for J where it's, you know, a tiny package that's in every common software. If you can exploit that little tiny thing that's everywhere, um, I think we're going to see more of those type of attacks. Um, I think we'll see more attacks on hardware and IOT. So again, if you can infiltrate the company and embed some bad code in an actual firmware chip or an onboard BIOS, uh, for, you know, IOT, camera, Bluetooth, oven, you name it. Um, you have now got a really a backdoor into networks all over the world in any number of industries. So I think from a, a company perspective, you, you really need to look at and, and adopt a true defense and depth type strategy where uh, even your own internal inside inside networks are not considered secure uh, that anything you know left to the right should be locked down and completely isolated on a business uh, case uses for ports protocols ips uh, and all that stuff so definitely a, a true defense in depth type solution where there is a zero trust uh, policy across everything across the entire network yeah zero trust is something we hear a lot of people talk about and bring up what are some of the challenges you've seen in terms of implementing that? Because we can appreciate what it can produce, but making people change behaviors can be difficult. So what are, what are some of your thoughts on implementing that? Yeah, it's, and it's a good thought. I know it's a term we hear thrown out a lot, zero trust. And I know some people don't like it because it's very vague and generic. Um, it really is, when you talk about implementation, a practice that encompasses uh, multiple things. There's not only the technology, so your actual firewalls and your IDS and your IPS and your WAF, uh, but there's the people and process behind it. So again, you can have all the security controls in the world and get sent a bad email with a, a Word doc embedded with some, you know, zero day malware that uh, if you open it, there's nothing you can do about that. So there has to be uh, people training. Uh, you have, they have to be educated in terms of what to click, what not to click, um, just best practices for passwords and, and storing those. Having a framework that looks at every aspect. It's not just it's not just your network stack. It's not just the application stack. You really have to look at it holistically across the board from the compute, the network, storage, your storage systems, any data loss protection you might have, file integrity monitoring. It um, it really is a, a robust, comprehensive construct that it, you really have to take time and dive into from you know a complete A to Z type method. Thanks, Matt. And for more information on the work SunGuard does, you can go to www.sungardas.com. That's S-U-N-G-A-R-D-A-S.com. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag. Com. For Matt Parsons, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.